Speaker of the day is a World Prize, a World Food Prize nominee. He is a CNN Hero 2013 Purpose Prize Fellow. He is a recipient of the Points of Light Tribute Award for AmpleHarvest.org, and the list that just continues to go on. But talking to him a little bit beforehand, there's a few things that he is probably more proud of. And the one thing he is probably the most proud of is being part of change in the orchestration of 7,241 food pantries across the United States receiving ample and successful and renewable donations of freshly harvested, locally grown food for families all over the place. He's also motivating growers to donate nearly millions of pounds per area. Over at the last time they stopped counting, a couple years ago, 30 million pounds have been donated throughout the nation to food pantries all over the place. He has helped, through his change, has helped hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of families get access to food, and freshly grown products that they may have never even been introduced to had it not been for the change initiated by AmpleHarvest.org. And one of the biggest numbers that he is probably most proud of, thanks to charitable contributions by people just like you all over the world, is zero. A number that has not grown since the start of the program. Zero, that's the number of dollars that it costs the participants of the program. That's the number of dollars it costs the communities who help foster the program. And that's the number of dollars that it costs the taxpayers of America to participate in ampleharvest.org. Ladies and gentlemen, we please give a warm welcome to Mr. Gary Oppenheim. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here, I really am. This is the talk I really enjoy giving the most to people, and so thank you very much for getting in here this early to, to join me for this. Um, very often you go to a speech and they say, please turn off your cell phones. I'd like you to keep your cell phones on. Silence them. But I'd like you to be free, texting, sending out messages about whatever moves you while we're talking, and share this with your network, because this is not about what I'm going to discuss with you. This is about what we're going to share with your entire network of friends and family across the country. Periodically, you're going to see at Ample Harvest, that's uh, our, our Twitter address, but there's going to be some text under it. And I'll encourage you to text that out or anything else that you want to share. This is a viral change that we're doing across the country, and I really, really want each of you to be a part of it. So a little bit more about me. I'm an aging geek. Uh, I'm proud of that. I'm a long distance bike rider. I'm a home gardener, a master gardener actually also. I'm a dancer and I'm a CNN hero. Uh, we each come with gifts, we each come with talents and mine happen to be, I think, outside of the box. Uh, I'm really good at connecting the dots. I see disparate things and they just seem like they should be brought together and I'm easily able to do that. I'm personally committed to social responsibility and I'm not stopped by the idea of somebody saying, you can't do it. That's sort of my motivation to get things done. I have a personal passion, which is I hate waste. I uh, was born in 1952, right after World War II, a few years after World War II was over, and I grew up with the mantra, finish what's on your plate, kids are starving in Europe. So this was inculcated in me. And this has driven me in terms of many things I've done through my life of dealing with waste, whether it's food, time, emotions, money. But each of you also have a passion, and I'd like to have maybe 20 people raise their hands. I'd like to hear from maybe 20 of you, what are your passions? Is it gender equality? Is it racial? Is it money? Is it hunger? So 20 hands, just raise them up and just let them, come on. Don't, come on, it's, yes? In poverty in our time. Okay, somebody else. Come on, yes? Okay, thank you, what else? Music? Hands over here, come You all have hands, we were born with two of them. <laughs> Let me see some. Don't be shy, what, what, yes? Habitat conservation. What was that? Habitat conservation. Conservation, okay, what else? 
Yes? Preservation of the Lakota way of life. Give me one or two more, please. Yes? Justice. Justice. One more. Yes? Empowering people. Empowering people. So thank you. So each of you, and even for those who didn't raise your hands, I'm pretty sure you all have something or some things that are really personally important to you and have been driving you or will drive you as your life goes on in terms of things you'd like to see happen and change in the world as time goes on. The elimination of waste is what has driven me. So I'm going to tell you my story. But as I'm doing this, I'd really like you to think about you in your frame of what's your passion and how that would have connected. So 2008, the New York Times uh, publishes this wonderful photograph by a photographer, assembled by photographer Bill Marsh. And this is a picture that represents the amount of food wasted by a family of four in a month. A pound a person a day, it's about 100 billion pounds a year across the country. And it stuck with me. I remember, I don't like waste, and this picture just stuck with me. It just, and it should, it bothered me, and it should really bother all of you. So I want to talk now a little bit about the waste of food in this country, and it is a global issue. I'm focused on the United States. So half of the produce in this country, half the produce we grow never gets consumed by anybody. 6% um, of our farmland is not being harvested. We are sending tens of millions of pounds of food to landfills every year. A pound a person a day, as he said, is being lost. And we're looking at about 122 pounds per person being thrown out every month. Everybody owns this problem. This is from the farmer to your and my kitchens. Nobody is not wasting food. This is not a new problem. This book was published by the United States Army. It was for American soldiers going to Great Britain in 1942 for World War II. And I happened to have opened the book up when I found it. And I want to read the part in yellow in case you can. Waste means lives. It's always been said that Americans throw more food into the garbage cans than any other country eats. This, thing, this is during World War II, and it's what the Army is telling the soldiers, that the waste of food can cost lives and can change the outcome of a war. So how much food are we losing? Well, the pie chart is, don't focus too much on the pie chart because it's not that important. I just want you to see that there have been statistics on how much food, and whether it's farm, or the store, or the warehouse, or your kitchen. But what people hadn't tallied, what hadn't been looked at, was the food waste in home and community gardens. Now, I don't know how many of you, go, show of hands, how many of you either have a home garden or are related or friends with somebody who has a garden? Look around, how many hands are up? It's a lot. And there's a reason it's a lot, because this generation, millennial generation, has actually had a 65% growth in home gardening, community gardening in the past five years. But we have 42 million people in this country who grow food in home and community gardens. 42 million, that's 35% of all households. Now, in 2008, 2009, with that um, uh, picture in the New York Times, I started undergoing my own little epiphany. I started thinking about the waste of food. We all know people are hungry, so that was already there in my mind. But I started thinking about the waste of food. I knew there was hunger. I knew gardeners grew too much. I grew too much. And from my own experience, there are only so many cucumbers you can give to friends and still have them call you a friend. I know that's hard to pawn this stuff up. And I'm going to tell you that in the South, people will lock their cars when they go to work. And it's not because it's going to get stolen. It's because they don't want to come back to a car full of zucchini. So people have the food, and they've been unable to get rid of it historically. Um, I, I don't like to waste. You all know that about me now. I, and I had an idea, but I didn't have a plan. So we're going to go on a learning curve now. I want you to see how I came to a change that ultimately changed the future of the country and actually in increasing the way in the world. We're going to look at the scope and the magnitude of hunger in this country, how the food bank, food bank network in America works, and how the food bank network in America actually fails. So we're going to break this down into a couple of things. This is important to understand the background of how our food safety network so you can see what, what the fix was. This map, 23 states, you take the combined population and you now have the 50 million people in this country who don't have enough food to feed their families. By the way, the term we use is food insecurity, which doesn't necessarily mean you're hungry, but it does mean you're at real risk of being hungry. So if you open a kitchen cupboard and there's a single can of tuna fish in there, you're not hungry yet, but there's a really good chance you're going to be hungry. So imagine all the population of all these states uh, that 
combined. There's, it's, by the way, more people than live in Canada are food insecure in the United States. This includes one out of four children under the age of six in America, except if you're Hispanic or African American, then it's one out of three. So we're raising a quarter of our kids today not having adequate access to food. The impact on their health is not insignificant. Um, we all know about the obesity, diabetes, the obesity epidemic, the diabetes epidemic, hypertech. Diet-related illnesses are costing this country a fortune, and it's a national security issue. 75% of the people who choose to apply for military service are rejected because they're not fit to serve. So if we ever had a real national security problem or we really had to raise a large army, we are actually in a, in a big problem. So we have all grown up with this idea. We've, you've all had food drives in your churches or maybe your schools, and you've all heard the same thing. Jars, cans, boxes, no fresh food. We've all heard that. So as somebody who's a grower, and I grow too much food in my garden, I would think to myself, well, I've got these extra tomatoes or carrots, and I, I can't take them to the food drive. I, they're not going to take them, that, that I've known. So now let's take a look at how the food bank network works. I told you we're going to take a quick look at how it works and what the choke point was and what the fail point is. So if you look at the map, you see a red bowl in the center. That's an organization called Feeding America. You, it's, you may have heard of it. It used to have the name of Second Harvest. It's an organization that has 200 food banks connected to it. Um, Feeding America South Dakota is obviously the local one here. And those are the blue balls around it. And then connected to each of the blue ones are these uh, orange ones. There are 32,000, 32,000 rather, 33, sorry, 1,500 of these food pantries. That's where people go when they want to feed their families, when they need to get food. So the food, the food and resources often flows from the Feeding America system through the food bank to the local food pantry. So on the bottom, you'll see a food bank is really essentially a large warehouse. You go in, it's big racks of food, you've got trucks coming in and trucks going out, and then they arrange for the food to get delivered days or weeks later to the regional, the local food pantry, and then from there it goes to the families. But here's the problem. That red line, it's a choke point time. A jar or a can or a box of food that sits on a shelf for a few days or a week is not a problem. It can obviously sit there and then get delivered, but you can't do that with fresh food. Tomatoes or lettuce, whatever fresh food people might want to bring in, won't survive days or weeks. And that's the reason why we were always told jars, cans, boxes, no fresh food, because that choke point. The result is that people like me, 42 million of us, when we have excess food in the garden, either try to pawn them off on people, shove them into somebody else's car, or just throw it away, compost it. Or worse, throw it into the trash, it then goes into the waste stream, where it not only adds to the waste stream, but oh, by the way, contributes to climate change, gas emissions, and trash dumps. So we've created an environmental problem by throwing that food away. I had an aha moment. Now, I told you I'm an aging geek. I, my background's in technology and computers. And I had, wait a minute, this can be fixed. This is not an impossible problem. I started thinking, what happened if growers didn't send food to the food bank, but got it directly to a local food pantry? What if we flattened out the system? What if I took the hub out of the picture and just we did it a peer-to-peer -peer thing where it goes right to a spoken in solution? So that was the idea that I had in uh, March of 2009. I had had a prior discussion with people in the community garden and I discussed the idea of if you have an ample harvest, let's donate it to people. I checked out online, ampleharvest.org was an available domain, so I bought it for $9. Remember the part I hate waste? I just spent $9, I couldn't let it go to waste, so I was stuck. I had to go on from there, I was sort of driven, I, which is really good for everybody. So what I ended up doing is figuring out in a couple of hour session, outlining what I thought needed to be done. When I was done with that couple of hour session, I looked back and said, oh my, I just built an entire system. Now I didn't actually build the final thing, I then brought two volunteers in to help me actually design it. But the idea was that if I built something so that a uh, food pantry could be found by the gardeners, and if I built something so the gardeners could be educated, they could be donated, we solved the problem. Let's, uh, one thing I should have pointed out, which I didn't earlier, is that by and large, you don't know where the food pantries are in your communities, unless you are in a church that has one, they tell you. But you don't go down the street saying, seeing signs saying there's a food pantry here. So we have these tens of thousands of food pantries across America and nobody knows where they were. So we had this lack of information and that's what this solved. So a woman in Missouri 
helped to design the website. She did the pretty front end. A gentleman in New Jersey did the data engine in the back end, and I did all the content. So simply put, if it's pretty, she did it. If it's data, he did it. And if you can read it, I did it. And over a period of several weeks, we built this. And by the way, this is a lesson to all of you. The reason we were able to get this built and launched very fast is there were no lawyers in the picture. Um, so, believe me, it, it, you'll, you'll learn in time. So the, the idea that I had as a search engine was to build something like this. Now, I should also say that to make this work, I had to build two components. I had to educate people that they could donate and build the ability for them to, to find the pantry to make the donation too. The back end, this, the website had to be built first and then we did the education process. I had to do it in sort of the reverse order. So basically you would type in your zip code, up would come a list of pantries that are signed up in our system to get food. Up would come the information about that. And then at this is the point. From this point, you deal directly with the food pantry. You've got too many tomatoes in your garden. You don't come to us. You now know that St. Mary's Church or the YMCA in your community takes food and you take it there. And you will probably do that for the rest of your gardening life. And for two reasons. Number one is this unclogged a backlog of food and I sincerely believe it unclogged a, backup, a backlog of goodwill. People wanted to share, they wanted to donate, they didn't want the food to go to waste, they did want to help their neighbors, and up to this point they were always told no. And we took that block away and now that flood of food and goodwill could come in. For the first time, ampleharvest.org allowed a food pantry to tell people when to donate food, days of the week, times of the day. Now that was really important from, because this way the growers, with the whole process of food flowing would be very smooth. The pantries were very concerned that they, did, they didn't have refrigeration or storage for fresh food. But the only way to not need refrigeration is to make sure the food's not there very long. So if the pantry is open on Sunday afternoons for clients to get food, ideally they should get the food Sunday mornings. Well, if the food's coming in Sunday mornings, myself as a gardener, I know I either should harvest Sunday morning or Saturday night. So by simply allowing the pantry to say, please come at this, on this day and this time, I as a gardener now knew when I should bring the food in. So I'd bring it in a few hours before the clients came to pick it up. They took it home and they ended up getting food fresher than you and I can buy in a supermarket. When I looked back at this, I had realized there was another really important point in here. There's an ethical component to charity. I think that's very, very important. Some of you may have read about this in, in some of your studies. But one of the things is you don't want to embarrass or humiliate the recipient of charity. Well, in our economy today, particularly in 2009 when I launched it, the economy was still in an economic meltdown. It was very plausible that a gardener who had an ample harvest in his or her garden might be friends or neighbors with somebody who had fallen on hard time and lost their job and was going to a food pantry. And if I came in with my food and my friend or neighbor was getting food, I might be embarrassed, but they might be humiliated. And they shouldn't be, but they might be. But by separating them by a little bit of time, by having me coming in in the morning and, the client, and my neighbor in the afternoon, I knew the food was going to somebody in my community, but I didn't know who. They knew it came from somebody in the community, but they didn't know who. The anonymity kept them from being humiliated. It also improved the, the entire flow of the food. The other thing for the first time was that pantries could actually say, we really want this and we don't want that. So that you might have a pantry serving a geriatric community, which really needs the pens and not diapers. Or you need a food pantry that serves a Jewish and Muslim community and they really don't want pork and beans. So if you were going to bring in store-bought food, store-bought items, at least you'd be able to bring in things that might best serve that particular community. The entire system was improved to have something so that excess supply actually met demand. So food started coming in. And we started getting pictures, and we started getting emails. We got emails rather from people who not only sent food in, but also from people who thought we could help them get food. And um, we can't, we send them up to United Way or National Hunger Hotline. I'll tell you the one that hurt me the most personally was when a woman in San Diego wrote and said that, I really need some help feeding my family. Um, my kid's not well, my husband can't work, and I'm having a hard time putting food on the table. And she was active due to US Navy. That should bother everyone. This is what happens when you have food, like fresh food coming into a food pantry. For the first time, food shows up that is not processed food necessarily. 
It's not jars or cans or boxes, it's salad or fruit or pineapple, depending on where you happen to live. And for the first time in some families, you have kids actually enjoying fresh food. You have too many kids today growing up thinking that apples come from sliced in cellophane or, pe or can peas come in cans and not pods. They don't have the connection to what real fresh food tastes like. And by opening up that opportunity, you change the future of that kid. Now, for all the time that whether Michelle Obama or Michael Pollan or Jamie Oliver say eat healthy, the lack of that food doesn't do anything to enable them to eat healthier. So once this launched, it was me then. The other two people in this project were sort of finished. It was me, how am I going to go to America? Mind you, at this point, it was one person, me. Um, we weren't yet a nonprofit. I was doing this under the auspices of an environmental program, and I was just driven by a mission to have it succeed and a passion because I didn't like the waste of food. So what I saw in ampleharvest.org was number one, it was really efficient. There were no logistics. I didn't need trucks. I didn't need refrigeration. I didn't need to ship anything. Why? The gardeners, 42 million people would drive the food within their own community. I didn't have to do it. It was simple. Everybody says it's simple. As a matter of fact, Jen Chapin, who's Harry Chapin's daughter, put it best. She said it's both simply beautiful and beautifully simple. This is as simple a solution as you can get to a major problem in the United States. It's universal. Well, pretty much. I've learned there's a few pockets here where you still can't get internet. But by and large, any place where you can get internet, and any place where there's food, and any place where there's a pantry, which is pretty much all across America, the solution actually fits and works very, very nicely. And lastly, it meets the pressing needs of the nation in terms of hunger, nutrition, um, diseases, etc. What I wanted other people to see was what it would deliver to them. And to me, the most important thing that ampleharvest.org delivered was it actually solved a problem. The traditional food safety net, the food bank system, feeds people, gets more money, feeds people, and it's an endless loop. And people need to be fed, and we should be giving to charity, and but it's not really solving the problem. Ampleharvest.org's mission was to eliminate the waste of food in home and community gardens. That was the problem. And by opening up the gates for that food to move, we actually solved the problem. It would lead us to the possibility that down the road, or the likelihood that down the road, when a gardener wakes up in the morning and has that moment of, oh my, there's more zucchini and I don't want it anymore, they're not going to think about letting it rot, but they're going to think about what time is the food pantry open today. It solves the problem. Then there are others. It costs a fraction of any other national program. And while, as you heard, that this doesn't cost the grower anything, this doesn't cost the food pantry anything, we, did, we are still a nonprofit, still a charity, self staff in technology. We go after foundations and donations to ask for support. But it's a fraction. It's, in, it's much, much less than any other program it could be in the country because all the logistics are sent elsewhere. It's sustainable, it relies on the inherent goodwill of the growers. The donations, by the way, and most people don't know this, are actually tax deductible. And it feels right. This is something that people look at and say, wow, this is great. And there are many other things in here that were really a plus. It um, reduces the waste of food, it's a lifelong solution. And the biggie, this was important in 2009 when the nation was discussing the future of the Obamacare uh, debate, it will reduce the nation's long-term health care costs. Because as we start getting healthier food to people, the likelihood of obesity, diabetes, hypertension starts to go down. And those are diseases that are going to really be killers for us in the standpoint from the economy. So um, I realized when I launched the this that the faith to community this initiative is really important. has been overwhelming. I mean, all kinds of faith communities have been stepping up. Muslim community leaders are hosting sports tournaments to <laughs> encourage young people to get active. The Jewish Community Centers Association is working with JCCs around the country to grow gardens and to get fresh food in underserved areas. And they're creating early child wellness programs. Groups like the National Council of Churches have joined with an organization called Ample Harvest to help gardeners donate fresh produce to 4,700 of their local food pantries. You can't do much better than that when you've launched a program, can you? Um, the funny thing is, and this is what I want you to start thinking about in terms of your own passions, when I launched ampleharvest.org, it was around a few months after the First Lady had launched Let's Move. And if you're not familiar with Let's Move, it's her program to tell particularly younger people, 
exercise, and eat better. That was, that's what Let's Move is all about. I wrote to the White House and I got this great new program and can we work? And somebody who didn't do a lot of reading or whatever wrote back and said, thanks, but no thanks. I said, okay, fine. And um, I continue to promote ampleharvest.org and th thanks to friends at the USDA, especially a gentleman named Max Finberg, who is the, the director of faith-based initiatives at USDA and subsequently at the White House. Ampleharvest.org out on the White House's radar. And today, we work closely, as you can tell, with both Let's Move and with the President's staff. As a matter of fact, the First Lady wrote a book called American Grown. It's a beautiful tabletop book, and there's a sidebar in there about ampleharvest.org.